And we're back at it again, chapter 10. We're gonna talk about membrane transport. And again, due to time, and also the complexity of what they throw into this chapter, we're going to simplify it. So pay attention to the things stressed in this lecture, and those will be likely what you'll see on the exam. So key concepts here is if we want to move something across a membrane, we've got to find a way to do that. Uh, first of all, we'll talk about the math of it, and then we need to look at methods. So some things can diffuse across, other things need help. Since we've got this nonpolar interior to a membrane, we've got that to deal with. So items that are charged tend not to just easily move across there, so we need to find ways to help. So first of all, let's talk about the free energy and why things would move. We're gonna throw some equations at you, but just sit back and say, yes, I believe. So we can set up a equilibrium-like equation. We're not undergoing a chemical reaction, but if we have substance A that's outside a cell, and it's in equilibrium with substance A inside the cell, we can actually set up a delta G equation and figure out if this uh, process is spontaneous or not. And so you can actually determine that uh, delta G is negative for diffusion of A as it moves from a high concentration to a low concentration. So if you set up this equation here, uh, you can see that, that that is a negative or a spontaneous process for things to move against their concentration gradient. Now, back here on this slide in B, I've got a concentration gradient, but it's a concentration gradient of ions. And so you can see on the left-hand side, there's more negative. On the right-hand side, there's more positive. And again, things would like to move to an equal distribution of charges across there. We're gonna see that in a lot of biological processes, we want this asymmetry of charges. And the same on the left-hand side. We're going to want more of one substance than on one side of the membrane than the other. So ten, things tend to want to go to this equilibrium and when we say equilibrium, this equal distribution of uh, compounds on either side of this membrane. And so again, if there's a difference between A out and A in, then that will be a spontaneous process. That does not necessarily mean that it will be a fast process. So I mentioned the charges because one of the things that we'll talk about is actually uh, electrical potential. And that is if we have a difference in the number of ions on one side of a membrane versus the other, and that sets up, up this electrical potential. So essentially it's the same as a concentration, but in this case we're looking at charges. And so in order to do that, we need to append some things to our equation. And that includes the electrical work that's required to transfer A across the membrane. And so we add in these factors and ZA is the charge of A, F is the Faraday constant, or the charge of one mole of electrons. And, uh, then the delta psi there, that is the, the voltage. And so now the G, the free energy, is an electrochemical potential. So what we want to notice from that is that this electrochemical potential is established in cells. I'll let you know right now we're not gonna have you do any calculations with this. But just understand we could calculate the free energy as well as the uh, 
electrochemical potential when we have these asymmetries between concentrations of either molecules or charges. So calculating delta G, there's a good example of this equation or this uh, a sample calculation in the book. The, uh, at least I'd have a look at how we can actually get to this potential. So the potential in cells is generally on the order of about negative 100 millivolts. So uh, not enough to shock you, but uh, generally important for ionic substances. Now the take home message out of this first section is across all domains of life, organisms tend to maintain ion gradients. And these ion gradients tend to make the inside of the cell more negative than its surroundings. And by convention, membrane potential is negative number when the inside of the cell is more negative than the outside. So just keep those things in the back of your head. And the second big thing is to understand that there's two types of transport processes. So you definitely need to know this, that there's what's referred to as non-mediated transport. So if we think about that, nothing is helping this transport to occur. It occurs through simple diffusion. The driving force is the flow of the substance through the medium is its chemical potential gradient. So moving from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And you're always going to move in the direction that eliminates its concentration gradient. So you're, as I'll stress again, you move from an area of high concentration to low concentration. And then you've got mediated transport. So you've got something that is helping to move things. And this occurs through the action of specific carriers. And in our case, we'll look at proteins. And within the mediated transport, you have those that are passive mediated transport or what is called facilitated diffusion. And so this takes advantage again of these concentration gradients and you move from high concentrations to low concentrations. And then you've got active transport. And so in this case, you need something to move against a concentration gradient. So you want to establish a concentrated gradient, and so you tend to move from a low concentration to a high. So you're trying to get uh, a higher concentration on one side, where passive mediated transport is just allowing things to move to equal concentrations across the, the membrane there. Okay, so here's some checkpoints. But uh, let's get into some specifics. And what we're going to first focus on is passive mediated transport. So like I said, the transport molecules across a membrane may be active or passive. So here in the box, we've got a couple of different examples of this. So let's kind of walk around this. So simple diffusion. So nonpolar compounds. Uh, in this case, if they were moving within the cell, they'd have a higher concentration outside, and they could just navigate through that hydrophobic interior and into the middle. So these are lipophilic or hydrophobic molecules. They can pass through the phospholipid bilayer down their concentration gradients. They don't require assistance. But many molecules require protein transports to get across. So either they're charged or they're large, and uh, you're still gonna move down your concentration gradient, but you need help to do that. And so this is called facilitated diffusion or passive diffusion. And so in this, you're moving down the gradient. So let's say again, I've got more on the outside, but I have some type of protein that's gonna help me get inside where it's a lower concentration. Uh, you've got other things, so like I said, ions tend not to move through the uh, interior, the hydrophobic interior of the membrane, but you could have what's referred to as an ionophore, and that's going to mediate that transport. Essentially what it does is it surrounds and shields the charge of the ion and allows it to navigate through that hydrophobic portion. So again, that is going to be mediated, but you're moving down the concentration gradient from high concentration to low. Uh, you can have these ion channels, 
that allow ions to move through. In this example, it's just some molecule. In this one, it's likely an ion. And then you have uh, active transport. And so we've got two examples of active transport over here, and we'll get to that in the next section, but just to introduce it now, you've got primary active transport. And this is where I'm trying to get a higher concentration. And so this is going to require energy to do so. So in this case, inside is going to be higher concentration. And so I'm trying to pump stuff and get a higher concentration inside. So you're moving against the gradient. And then you got secondary active transport. So again, you're driving against the gradient. You're establishing a higher concentration inside. But in this case, uh, you can couple it with the movement of something else. So uh, it's driven by maybe the ion moving down its gradient or, or something else moving down its gradient, uh, not necessarily having energy by hydrolysis of ATP, but you couple this is favorable with this is being unfavorable. And we'll talk about that in the active transport section. But this section right here is simply passive transport. And so it's mediated. We're gonna talk uh, not really just about uh, passive transport by diffusion, but we're gonna talk about it being mediated by something. And so we've got proteins that can do that and there are various names. So carriers, permeases, channels, ionophores, transporters. Uh, let's focus on the ionophores first. We're gonna have carrier ionophores. So they're gonna increase the permeability of membranes by binding to the ion and then help it diffuse. So like in this case here, it binds on one side and then it can shield the charge there and then kind of flop over to the other side and release it. Or you can have channel forming or pore forming ionophores that will actually allow the ions to flow through. So these are mediating. Notice the concentration. This is important to notice that I've got more of these tannish balls on the outside. And so they're moving against their uh, concentration gradient. They're moving into the cell where it's a lower concentration. So let's look at one of the first ones. So valinomycin, it's made by uh, streptomyces, and these are common soil bacteria. And so uh, these are interesting molecules. It's a cyclic peptide with a repeating unit that also includes some D amino acids in it and also has some ester linkages. So just uh, a well-studied uh, ionophore. So again, this is gonna be one of those that helps transfer an ion from one side to the other. And if you think about it, what it needs to do is shield the charge on the ion and expose and have an exposed hydrophobic region. So it can actually get buried in the membrane but yet it uh, will not allow that charge to be interacting with the interior of the membrane. And so the potassium is coordinated and its charge is met by octahedrally, by carbonyls of the six valine residues there. And it has a really high affinity for potassium, much more than sodium. If you remember talking about crown ethers in organic chemistry, it's kind of the same idea. The cavity within the valinomycin is just the right size. Uh, the arrangement of those amino acids uh, allows it to easily coordinate the potassium. If you try to put sodium in there, sodium is smaller, and so it doesn't fit as well. And so if sodium tried to fit in there, it would uh, bring along some waters, and that hydration sphere of sodium with water is just too large to fit in there. We'll see that operate later on. And then same with lithium, it's just too small as a ion. So this is the Goldilocks valinomycin is just perfect for binding potassium. So there's other pores. We talked about porins. Uh, so for example, the op F in E. coli, it forms an elliptical pore. And let me make sure that you can see that. 
So we've seen these uh, pull runs before uh, when we're talking about structures and beta barrels. So these are bacterial porins. Uh, in this case, the Omp F is a 16 strand beta barrel, and they allow solutes uh, that are under 600 Daltons through. Weakly selective for cations, but it allows uh, small positively charged molecules through most easily. So that's just one example of. Uh, some ionophores. Let's look at a more specific example. Oh, we got stuck. Let me see. There we go. We got it. So this is what's known as maltoporin. It's a selective porin. And so it is selective for maltose uh, or maltodextrin. Maltose is actually a disaccharide and maltodextrin is just the term for an oligosaccharide. Essentially what it is is starch that's been digested into smaller pieces. And so this porin forms an 18 strand beta barrel. And so this is, uh, so maltodextrin has the alpha 1,4 glucose linkage. So essentially the same linkage as starch. And you can see that it coils up into a coil. And so one side of the channel is lined with hydrophobic residues and it matches the left hand helical curvature of maltodextrin. And so referred to as kind of the greasy slide. And you also got a tyrosine that projects into the channel. And you can see that in this region right here. And that helps select for just glucose residues in there. And so the maltodextrin actually will slide down the, the greasy slide here and just has uh, essentially a complementary sequence there. It's kind of interesting that it matches the helical twist of the maltodextrin. And so it follows a screw-like path and threaded in the correct direction. Now we want to talk about some ion channels. Uh, so we talked a little bit about how the porin is slightly more selective for cations and how valinomycin is very selective. But we want to talk about channels. If you remember, those go all the way through the membrane where like valinomycin actually would be one of those that transfers it from one side to the other. So ion channels are highly selective and they quickly transport small ions, potassium, sodium chloride. Uh, they do this to maintain osmotic osmotic balance and signal transduction uh, and also neural transmission. So if we look at just the general, uh, general concentrations of ions outside of mammalian cells, we've got high concentrations of sodium and inside we have a high concentration of potassium. We've got a little bit more or sorry, sodium on the inside than we have potassium on the outside. So really, we don't have a lot of potassium outside our cells. In fact, if you want to kill someone, you administer just potassium chloride. And as you inject that into them, since we don't have a lot of potassium on the outside of our cells, as that goes throughout their body, it essentially just messes everything up. And you get uh, your cells try to repolarize. And anyway, lead to cardiac arrest. It's one of the drugs that they administer to people in lethal injections. So many potassium channels are found in single-celled organisms. They all have highly high selectivity for the potassium channels for potassium over sodium. And they let the potassium through at nearly the diffusion limited rate, meaning when they're open, the potassium ions are flowing through at a very rapid pace, uh, 100,000 ions per second. And so one of the questions is, how do they maintain selectivity at such a high rate? 
you're just allowing those ions to essentially run through. How are you screening and only allowing the potassium ions through? And what we'll do is look at a specific example of a potassium channel, and that will help us understand where this selectivity comes in. And so we can see uh, here is the structure of KCSA. It is a selective uh, potassium channel. Potassium binds down here at the bottom and is transported through to the outside of the cell. And up here at the top, they have what is referred to as the selectivity filter. And so if we kind of look at how this works, we've removed the backbones. And what we see is that the carbonyls form a conserved sequence. And you can see what that conserved sequence is. And that forms a selectivity filter. So there's four coordination sites that bind potassium much better than the smaller sodium. And as the potassium goes up through the channel, at each spot, eight carbonyls are ordered at the corners of a square antiprism. And that is just a cube that has one face rotated. And that matches the coordination <clears throat> of the inner hydration shell of potassium in solution. So essentially, as the potassium moves out of the aqueous and into this channel, the oxygens within the channel coordinate it the same way that water would in a bulk solution. And then the question is, well, why isn't sodium transported? And it's due to this selectivity filter. So it's too small for sodium with its coordinated shells of water. So like I mentioned, the ionic radius of sodium is smaller, but when you get the water coordinating it, it makes it much larger. So the selectivity filter won't allow that through. And, uh, and then the selectivity filter by itself doesn't coordinate sodium very well. So the selectivity filter by itself is too big to coordinate sodium effectively. So the delta G for getting the sodium into these sites would be large. So again, this is kind of the Goldilocks principle where the potassium just happens to have the right size and the right orientation of oxygens to coordinate it where sodium being smaller doesn't. And if sodium wanted to bring along its friends water, that leads to problems as well. And so what is the function of these ion channels? Remember in mammalian cells, we have a lot higher concentration of sodium on the outside and a much higher concentration of potassium on the inside. Now let me just go back here to this picture. Well, the sodium's actually flowing outside. So how can we keep a higher concentration of, sorry, I said sodium, I meant potassium. The potassium's flowing outside. So how can we keep a higher concentration of the potassium inside if these channels are open and just allowing potassium just to flow freely outside? Well, that is a very good question. And the answer is that these channels are gated. These ion channels are normally closed. However, if they get some stimuli, then they end up opening, and that is when the potassium can move from the inside of the cell outside. And so there's a bunch of different types of gating responses. Some of them are mechanosensitive. So in response to touch or sound or changes in osmotic pressure, Essentially, you deform the lipid bilayer and that puts some pressure on the channel and it will open up. There are ligand gated. And what that means by that is if you have some ligand that binds to the channel, that will cause it to open. Some are signal gated. So if there is a signal such as release of calcium uh, within the cell, that will then kind of 